Good morning and welcome to our service. As we continue our series in the Sermon on the Mount and specifically the portrait of the believer, I'd invite you to turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 8. We'll pray and get started. So Lord, once again, we thank you for your goodness to us, this opportunity to once again study the Holy Scriptures. I pray, Lord, you would lead us and guide us and help us as we look at these important words that we might be encouraged by them this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In 1970, I attended Lord Selkirk School in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Mrs. Thompson was my second grade teacher. From what I remember and from what people tell me, I was prone to asking far too many questions, and apparently I asked Mrs. Thompson perhaps the dumbest question of all. How do you know so much? It didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but at a subsequent parent-teacher interview, Mrs. Thompson expressed her irritation with me. And as my mother and I left the classroom, she looked down at me and said, why do you ask so many questions? And why would you ask the dumbest question of all? Now, my mother didn't call me an idiot. She didn't have to. I could feel her displeasure. By asking so many questions, so often, some of which were blatantly dumb, my seven-year-old self was not only an annoyance, but an embarrassment as well. Fast forward several decades, five or so, you might have noticed that things haven't changed all that much. I'm still asking questions, plenty of them. It's even possible that for some of you, I'm a bit of an annoyance. But truthfully, I want to know what things mean. I want to articulate as best I can what I've come to learn. And when it comes to the Scriptures, my questions intensify exponentially, which is why I often focus on a single verse rather than a complete passage. And it's also why it takes me so long to get through a book. As a preacher wanting to teach the Bible accurately, I have to have a comprehensive understanding of what's being said so that I can teach it myself and others can learn. Jonathan Edwards writes, There is an order of men which Christ has appointed on purpose to be teachers in his church. But they teach in vain if no knowledge of these things is gained by their teaching. You see, if I don't ask questions, then I'm not looking for answers. And if I don't have any answers, then I have nothing to say. Asking the right questions will often lead to finding the appropriate answers. Not always, but that's the principle. All that to say, after looking at the verse before us this morning, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, just 11 words. There's no way I can just read it and move on. I have questions. Lots of questions. For instance, what is meant by the heart? What is the heart? Second, what is it to be pure in heart? Third, how is the heart made pure? And finally, what is it to see God? Especially after reading what Moses was told by God. You cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. So while this verse may seem a simple statement requiring a simple and straightforward explanation, it really isn't all that simple. In fact, these are some of the most profound words in the New Testament. 
What Jesus says here is of vital importance because according to him, only the pure in heart will see God. The psalmist writes in Psalm chapter 5, verse 4, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Following his temptation in the wilderness, the beginning of his preaching and healing ministry, and the calling of his disciples, Jesus went up on a mountain and began teaching his new friends. Beginning with the first three Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are the meek, the Lord characterizes the new nature of the believer, not just some, but all. This is who the Christian is. This is what he or she is meant to be. This is the portrait of the believer. To be poor in spirit is to recognize our need of God. To mourn over our sin is to acknowledge our inability to produce anything good in and of ourselves. To be meek is to be truthful about our spiritual condition and therefore refuse to elevate ourselves over anyone else. Which brings us to verse 6, the high point of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And while the first three Beatitudes are concerned with a person's need, the high point in verse 6 is where they are satisfied. The next three Beatitudes, the merciful in verse 7, the pure in heart in verse 8, and the peacemakers in verse 9 are the result of being satisfied. The psalmist writes in Psalm 63 verse 3, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied. Satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. The portrait of the believer in verses 3 through 9 leads to verses 10 through 12, which describes the world's response to those who belong to God, what unbelievers think of believers. And it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it has hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, then they will also persecute you. What Jesus communicates to his disciples, and by extension all believers, is if they choose to follow him, there will be a cost in that decision. And, and the more they think, look, and act like him, the more they acknowledge him as Savior and Lord, then the more the world will hate them. But that's just the beginning. Because in verses 13 through 18 of this same chapter, he highlights the Christian's fitting response to the inevitable persecution. You are the salt of the earth, he said, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the salt of the light of the world, excuse me. You are the light of the world. 
a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Who are the others? The others are the persecutors, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As serious students of the Bible, it's important to remember that these familiar verses do not stand entirely on their own. They belong together. They are connected and must be read and understood in the light of the context. According to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, the believer who he describes in verses 3 through 9 will, to one degree or another, suffer persecution for righteousness' sake. And the proper response to that persecution, as difficult as it may or may not be, is to not lash out in anger or frustration, but rather to let your light shine in the midst of the darkness. Peter writes, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Living as a Christian has its consequences. Yet following Jesus is the most consequential thing a person can do. Why? Because apart from him, you will not see God. All right, let's look at our verse. Blessed are the pure in heart. The pure in heart, for they shall see God. Notice the emphasis is on the purity of heart and not necessarily on the promise. In other words, the promise is reserved for the pure in heart. Be assured, the gospel is not merely concerned with the outward appearance of correctness, but of inward holiness, the heart. But what is the heart? Is Jesus talking about the organ in our chest or of something else? From what our Lord says, people can be judged by what they say and what they do because these things reveal what's inside them. It'll become obvious. That's what's meant by the heart. When the prophet Samuel looked at Eliab, the son of Jesse, and after seeing his impressive stature or physique, he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearances, but the Lord looks on the heart. When the Bible speaks of the heart, it's talking about the whole person. The whole person, the seat of their being, the center of their life. Their innermost desires, their feelings, emotions, affections, passions, impulses, and actions. The heart points to who a person really is, what they think, say, do, and believe. Whenever Jesus met with the Pharisees, scribes, and the teachers of the law, his challenge was based on the condition of their hearts. Though appearing extremely religious, these men were not at all who they presented themselves to be. And Jesus saw right through their charade. They played the part all right, but in reality, their hearts, their whole beings were far from God. They weren't spiritual at all. Quoting Isaiah, Jesus said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart, who they really are, is far from me. In vain do they worship me. Though they said the right things, the entirety of these men's beings, their hearts, 
were not at all aligned with what they were saying. Therefore, their words, as profound as they may have been, fell flat. They were, in Jesus' words, hypocrites. Hypocrites. Matthew 15, verse 18, what comes out of the mouth, Jesus said, proceeds from the heart, from the innermost being of the person. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. To his opponents, the Pharisees, Jesus said, the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. We could put it this way. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What the heart is full of. If you want to know what's really inside a person, if you want to know who they actually are, then simply watch what they do and listen to what comes out of their mouth. And while some may think this to be a judgmental approach to evaluating someone, it surely isn't. It's being realistic. Jesus tells us how we're able to judge a person's true character, who they actually are. And while character can be suppressed or bottled up for a time, pressure will reveal character. Each tree, he says, is recognized by its fruit. If you want to know what kind of tree or fruit you have, you have to look at its fruit. Fruit is the natural product of the tree, which makes perfect sense. If a person is consistently miserable, angry, rude, unreasonably demanding, or immoral, you can be assured that no matter what they say, this is what they are like on the inside. This is their heart. Furthermore, if a person lies, cheats, and steals with regularity, and if they conduct themselves with no regard for the truth, for what's advantageous uh, to others, or for what's right, then that is who they really are. On the other hand, if a person is consistently kind, honest, encouraging, considerate, polite, and beneficial to others, then you can be sure that that is what they are like on the inside. That's the principle here. And while it's possible to conceal one's true character for a time, what's inside will eventually come out. Christianity is not defined by intellectual assent or by simply agreeing with or even adhering to a particular set of doctrines. It's far deeper than that. To be a Christian is to be transformed. It's to be born again. It's to be filled with the Holy Spirit who then empowers the believer to live the life required of them. To follow Christ requires a clean heart and a new spirit. And without the indwelling Holy Spirit, the helper whom Jesus promised to send, what he requires here is impossible for anyone to do. The predisposition of the unregenerate heart is to follow the patterns of the world. And unless the heart is changed, this tendency will persist. Remember, these are spiritual words given to a spiritual people in order that they might know who they are in Christ. A purely mechanical interest in Scripture or in the faith will save no one. The Pharisees knew the Old Testament Scriptures better than most. Yet their understanding of what was written completely eluded them 
and they remain blind to the truth. According to Jeremiah, the heart, the seat of being, the center of a person's life is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Like it or not, the prophet describes every single person other than the Lord himself who has ever lived. Prior to knowing and being saved by Christ, the condition of everyone's heart is consistent, dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible says all are lost, separated from God, and unable to find their way to him. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Apart from God's saving grace, all that remains is hopelessness and helplessness. A sinful heart in need of salvation. Which just brings us back to the first beatitude. Blessed are those who know their need of God. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Be assured. Intellectual expertise and lockstep religious behavior may appear noble. But these things will save no one. What a sinful, rebellious, and lost mankind needs is a Savior. A Savior who alone can take a heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. The Pharisees were disposed to reducing the way of life, righteousness, and godliness to a matter of conduct, ethics, and behavior. They thought that through their good works, not only would they fool and impress their neighbors, but they could make themselves presentable to God as well. However, as Jesus points out, their hearts were bad. Their hearts were infected. Their hearts were repulsive. Everything about them, including their so-called good works, was an offense to God, and they were living in the shadow of a lie. The fact of the matter is this. If God didn't have their hearts, if he didn't have their everything, then he wasn't at all interested in them or their religious rituals, which in their collective minds made them worthy of his affection. They had it all wrong. God wasn't interested in their sacrifices if he didn't have their hearts. In the coming days, months, and perhaps years, especially with the volatility of our society and world, we may see a wholesale, headlong dive into what's called spirituality, the belief in a higher power than oneself, an intelligent yet unknowable being of some kind. And while this language may sound somewhat encouraging and it might even affect culture in a positive way, the danger of living a spiritual life without having a change of heart will be catastrophic. Good intentions will save no one. Morals, ethics, and wholesome citizenship will not build a bridge to God. The Bible is clear. All must turn to Christ for salvation. Paul writes, because of your hard and impenitent heart, the whole of yourselves, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each according to his works to those who by patience and well-doing uh, seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Make no mistake. Only the pure in heart, only those who by faith 
have believed, repented of their sin, and turned to Christ will see God. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The believer, the one who has been sprinkled with clean water and is clean, the one who has been given a new heart and a new spirit is aligned with Christ in every possible way. Intellectually, emotionally, morally, physically, and spiritually, the mind as well as the heart, the whole of themselves. All others remain outside the kingdom. They are enemies of God destined for destruction. Now that we know what the heart is, what is it to be pure in heart? To be pure in heart can be understood in at least two different ways. First, it means to be clean, to be blameless, unsoiled, unstained, and void of evil. To be pure in heart is to be without any imperfection whatsoever. The psalmist writes, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. To be pure in heart is to be washed by the blood of Jesus and clothed in his righteousness. The Bible says God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Be certain. There is but one way to approach a holy God. They must be clean. They must be pure. They must be free from any defilement whatsoever. Anything less than perfect flawlessness is insufficient. It's not good enough. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, John tells us who will be admitted into the heavenly Jerusalem that is to come. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, he writes nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, does that mean that you and I are perfect and without sin? Hardly. What it does mean is through genuine repentance, where we mourn over our sin, God forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He washes us clean. Keep in mind, to be pure in heart is not something we can do for ourselves any more than we can approach a holy God on our own terms. Purity of heart, which is the portrait of the believer, is the supernatural work of a loving and gracious God who chooses saves, regenerates, and sanctifies His people. All others remain outside His kingdom. In the book of Revelation, elsewhere, John describes the purity of the New Jerusalem in this way. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like transparent or clear glass. That's the picture of purity. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysopas, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Purity is 
holiness, without blemish of any kind. To be pure in heart is to be without a blemish, which is what God through Christ has done to and for the believer. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. This is God speaking through his prophet. God says this. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. Uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart. A new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Purity of heart means clean and without defilement, something only God can do for us. Second, purity of heart means single-minded sincerity. It means without hypocrisy. It's to be singularly focused on living for and pleasing Jesus Christ in everything. To be pure in heart, or the pure in heart, is the one that is no longer divided, no longer double-minded, no longer hopelessly scattered or unsettled. To be pure in heart is to know and keep the first and great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with yourselves, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, the entirety of your being. To be pure in heart means to be perfectly united and aligned with Christ and to live in willing obedience to him. It's to recognize Jesus as our greatest and most valued treasure and to be fully satisfied in him. To the Philippians, Paul writes, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. I've reprioritized everything and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. The psalmist writes, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Lloyd-Jones writes this, to be pure in heart means that we should live to the glory of God in every respect and that that should be the supreme desire of our life. It means that we desire God, that we desire to know Him, that we desire to love Him and to serve Him. And our Lord states here, that only those who are like that shall see God. That brings us to our final question. What is it to see God? What is it to see God? And while we attempt to answer the, uh, the question, we should remember what the writer of Hebrews said. Hebrews 12, verse 14, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. What does it mean to see? Because to see is simply, uh, is beyond simply gazing upon something. It's all that, but more. To see is to participate in and experience what one sees. For the Christian, the sight of God and His glory, the weightiness of His divine being, should be our greatest desire. 
Who among us is not excited at the notion of one day standing amongst the throng of believers and the myriads of angels singing to the top of our lungs around God's throne? Revelation 7, verse 9, here's the scene. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. If you are a believer, if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, that's what awaits you. That's what coming. And since that's our eternal destiny, it's incumbent on us to remind ourselves that since light and darkness cannot coexist, since Christ and Belial have nothing in common, and since we belong to God's kingdom, then we must commit ourselves entirely to a life of purity and holiness. For only the pure in heart will see God. John writes, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. But again, I'm left with yet another question. Is this everything Jesus has in mind here? In other words, other than eternity in God's presence, as amazing as that will be, is there another application, a more contemporary application? Is seeing God a physical reality, or is it only a futuristic reality and a spiritual reality? The Bible speaks of people catching a glimpse of God, not his face, but his form, which seems to indicate that in a physical sense, it is impossible to see a full revelation of God's glory. In the book of Exodus, Moses asks God, please show me your glory. Show me your glory. And while he had already seen something of God's glory, first at the burning bush, then with the 70 elders who saw God, yet again when he went to the mountaintop and entered the cloud of God's presence, and again at the tent of meeting, where the pillar of cloud descended from heaven, Moses knew there was more to see. The prophet wanted to have a personal encounter with, with the glory of God. Amazingly, God said, okay, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face. For a man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. In allowing Moses to see as much of his glory as he could 
physically bare, God shielded him from any deadly exposure from his radiant glory. In this incredible encounter, Moses was protected by God from God. For the glory of God is more than any mortal can bear. From this, it seems clear no person has or ever will see God physically. But there's another problem as well. God is spirit. While conversing with the woman at the well, Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God does not have a physical body and therefore cannot be seen in a physical sense. Now, there are a few occasions in Scripture, in the Old Testament, where God took on a form and sometimes a physical body and was seen. But these moments called theophanies were for a particular time and for a particular reason. John writes, no one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen Him in all His glory. Jesus said, The Father who sent me has borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. And you do not have His word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom He has sent. Scripture seems to indicate that in our unglorified state, We will not see God in a physical form. However, Scripture is just as clear that the pure in heart will see God. That's what Jesus is teaching. Is this a contradiction? Not at all. Not at all. As with the rest of the Beatitudes, the promise, this promise, is fulfilled in the here and now and more fully in the future. In other words, both statements are true. We see God and we will see God. To the Corinthians, Paul writes, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. As believers, we don't have to wait to see God. By simply opening our eyes, we see the work of His hands everywhere. And therefore, we know He exists. Unlike the unbeliever who refuses to honor God as God, the Christian sees God in nature and in history. They see Him in their own experience and when others come to the faith. Make no mistake, the glory of God is seen in transformed lives. And the longer the Christian lives in Christ, the more acutely they are of God's presence. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way, Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. God is invisible, but that does not mean He isn't seen. Jesus came so we could see God. And the more we see Him in Scripture, the more we see and understand the Father. On one occasion, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Do you remember what Jesus said? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The clearest picture of God our Father is seen in Jesus the Son. John writes, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And while we will never see God in a physical sense, we see Him all around us in His Word, and most importantly, in Jesus. That being said, the day is coming when we will literally see Him as He is. Jesus has been raised from the dead, and so too will all who believe 
be raised from the dead. And on that day, we will see him in all his glory with our own eyes. We will see his face. For the Christian, there is far more to come and far more for us to see. And as faithful followers of the Lord, we long to see the face of our Savior. In the meanwhile, like the prophet Moses, we should ask God to show us as much of His glory as we can physically bear. For His glory leads to our goodness. Remember, we cannot purify ourselves. We cannot wash ourselves clean. Only Christ can do that for us. But that does not absolve us from desiring to live a clean, pure, and holy life. We must agree with John, who said, Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Shall we pray? Lord, I thank you for your word. And I pray this verse would resonate within each and every one of us, that we are clean, pure, justified, reconciled to God because of Christ, who has done that for us. We stand before a holy God because of Jesus, forgiven, clothed in his righteousness, and we are welcome. We are thankful, Father, for your mercy, for your grace, for your goodness, for your salvation, for your glory. I pray we would grow and become the people that we have been called to become. Concerned with our lives that we would live them to your honor, to your glory, in the purity that we are to live. That we might glorify you with our lives, with our hearts, with the whole of ourselves. And it is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen.